people are living today in this country in clustered communities. Kids are growing up with people who look, believe, vote, worship, and go on to futures that are a lot like themselves. But what if there are a way for kids to study abroad, right here in America? This past year, the American Exchange Project has begun to set up an exchange between high school students in two vastly different communities, one in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and the other in a wealthy Boston suburb. This summer, they'll pack their bags and spend a couple weeks in each other's hometowns, getting to know a new part of the country and perhaps a new way of life. You don't need to like politics to do ADP. You don't need to know anything about the state of America to do ADP. This is really born from just a curiosity of what's around the corner. The American Exchange Project is the brainchild of David McCullough III, who spent the summer between his junior and senior year visiting high schools across the country and discovering the immense disparities in American public education and the stark differences between communities. Now he's trying to build a program that will help students do the same. I sat down with David to talk about his vision for the program, exactly how he structures these conversations, and how he thinks about issues of class, culture, and politics in the context of our children's future. I think of the cafeteria table metaphor again and again, just sure, come on, sit down, we got a seat for everybody. Welcome to the Better Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, Kieran O'Connor. David McCullough III, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So the tagline of the American Exchange Project is study abroad in your own country. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the concept behind the project? Sure. The evolution of it, and uh, then we can get into where you hope to take it. Yeah. I, I mean, the the um, the kind of quick and easy version is we're I along with a few others we're taking the idea of a study abroad an exchange program um, on the idea that we're living in a country that's a little short on empathy and understanding for one another and we're applying that to the United States and anyone who's taken a road trip or gone to a place that's very far away from the one they've grown up knows that we live in a country that's almost as big as a continent I mean, many are, mm. many of our states are bigger than most countries and so. You know, why not this idea of study abroad in America? Why shouldn't that work? Um, and so that's our that's our capstone program, as you said earlier, to study abroad in your own country. And we're using that for high school seniors to uh, go live for a couple weeks in a place that's very different from the one in which they grew up. So you know, picture kids from the suburbs of New York City living in a tiny town in the bayou of Louisiana. And then mm. with their friend that they live, this is couch to couch, um, bringing them back up here. And while they're there, they're doing all the things that one would do if you studied abroad in, say, Paris or Hong Kong or Singapore. Uh, cultural immersion, exposure to local businesses and professions, and then uh, programs through local institutions, mostly colleges and universities. Um, the idea came from, and I think we can talk about more of the story uh, later, because it, it gets into a lot of what we're doing and the kind of larger movement we're a part of. But the idea came from a, a realization that I and a few others had going around the country, realizing that people really felt like they were living in bubbles today. And if you mm. look at the residual effects of political polarization, economic inequality, globalization, uh, people are living today in this country in clustered communities. Um, so kids are growing up with people who look, believe, vote, worship uh, and go on to futures that are a lot like themselves. There's not a, a heck of a lot of diversity in American communities right. outside of our major metropoles. Um, and so what was interesting is I, I did a research project as an undergraduate uh, on poverty and education in America and came back hearing a lot of kids in poor communities saying, I feel like I'm growing up in a bubble. I'm, I'm unable to get out. Um, I feel like the world doesn't understand me and where I'm from. Uh, and then I, I went and was sort of throwing the idea around, you know, what can I do uh, as a the last year, 24 year old to, you know, help this serious situation our country's in right now. And I was substitute teaching to earn a few savings in the meantime and started talking to my kids in this town that I grew up in, which was a, uh, you know, upper middle class suburb of Boston. 98% um, of the kids are going off to colleges, four year colleges. Most parents have, you know, bachelors or higher. Mm. Um, and I asked kids, you know, what do you, what do you not like about where you're living? And they said, just like the kids in these small towns out in rural America, I feel like I'm growing up in a bubble. 
Sudbury is kind of a bubble and we don't really get out. And when I thought about my own friends uh, who were kind of on the back end of this period of early life, uh, we'd all gone to similar colleges. We'd all picked up similar degrees at those colleges. We'd all moved to similar cities, in many cases in the same neighborhoods. Right, and it just reinforces and the just, divide even further. Even further. And so what was interesting is that by virtue of the work I was doing, I was kind of living in two worlds. And I was working at the time with, where I was throwing an idea around for some type of nonprofit with Paul Salman, who's PBS's economics correspondent, and uh, Arlie Hochschild, who wrote uh, Strangers in Their Own Land, which is a, you know, one of the best books that explains uh, why our president got to where he is. Um, and they, like me, had been kind of debating this, what do we do about these two worlds that have grown up? And I said, hey, here's an idea. And I started talking to these kids and I talked to my kids in Sudbury and said, are you interested in Lake Charles, Louisiana? Couture, How did Texas. you find Lake Charles, Louisiana in so particular? That, so that's Lake Charles is where Arlie wrote her book about. So Arlie and, and what's so interesting and kind of what's uh, what I think is is maybe the greatest grain of optimism in a time where you see a lot of pessimism out there is how quickly social relations can begin between people if you start on on points of common connection, mm -hmm. points of common humanity. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, Arlie for her project, she had a friend who had a friend who lived in Lake Charles, Louisiana and called that woman saying, hey, can I come down? And uh, she was interested in researching why it was that the Tea Party was so strong in a state that received more tax dollars from the federal government than it contributed. And yet here they right. are touting the virtues of tiny government. I mean, doesn't that seem like, you know. A frequent question you hear among uh, right. liberal elites these days, you know, how could people in such poor areas vote for politicians who are gonna strip them of their right. benefits? Bite in the hand that feeds you in kind right. of a, a very elitist uh, way. But, uh, and, and I think if you one one frames a question that way, a lot of folks would scratch their heads too. Mm -hmm. um, I don't I don't mean to deconstruct the entire state of Louisiana, the Tea Party, but it was a it, it's definitely a ripe area for a sociological study. And what is the profile of Lake Charles? Is it rural? You know, it's what's a, the vibe um, there? It's a pe it's basically it's a petrochemical city. It's hmm. um, it's uh, it it has roots in that kind of. Uh, Cajun history, which is more Lafayette, Louisiana. That's about an hour east. But Lake Charles um, is, is has an old Southern feel, um, and it's it's lodged right on the southwest corner of Louisiana, up on Lake Charles, which is uh, a lake that's fed by a few rivers and bayous uh, that has become a great shipping port. And so surrounded surrounding Lake Charles are these massive petrochemical plants. I mean, at night mm. when they're lit up, they look like a city. Mm. Um, so slightly different from affluent suburban Boston. <laughs> moderately different, <laughs> yeah, to say the least. Um, and yet I fill up my car once a week. And shouldn't I know where all that's coming from? Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Uh, um, so you get connected to Lake, the Lake Charles community. Yeah. And do you sort of have this as like a light bulb idea? Or is this something that sort of develops over time as you're thinking about the two worlds that you've been immersed in. It began for it began for me a little bit before that in the summer of 2016, the tumultuous mm -hmm. summer of 2016. Yes, I remember it well. <laughs> I was going to say. Um, and I I was a, a junior at Yale and I had a fellowship to do a research project on effectively whatever I wanted. It was it was a, the program in grand strategy, which is it's a, a sweet sweet gig. It's a sweet gig. Um, yeah. And uh, and I, I the, the the program was you had to do a research project on something having to do with grand strategy. So the grand mm -hmm. strategy of insert whatever entity you want to study. And I was curious. My dad's a high school teacher. Um, I'd. I, uh, through being a baseball player, had had great friendships with kids who'd gone to a mm. great diversity of schools from affluent prep schools totally. to, to um, my best friend. Sports friends. and music I found growing up um, and something I've continued to find through Better Angels, more so with music than sports, although sports is an interesting thing to think about because yeah. I love sports. Uh, but sort of these external dynamics that can transcend uh, geographical and identity-based division. Oh, yeah. Um, so... Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that, and especially I think the bonds that can get forged among a team. 
yeah. uh, when you're sort of working together yeah. uh, with common purpose um, and perhaps in some cases uncommon sacrifice, yes. which makes me think of the military as well, right. uh, and some of these dwindling uh, convening institutions that for right. so long um, acted as the glue that can yeah. sort of hold communities together. And I think that's something that a, a bunch of writers have been writing about, the decline of these um convening and regulating institutions. Um, so not to get off on a tangent, but it's just interesting that you mention um, baseball because I found that to be the case uh, in my high school as well, but yeah. with soccer. Yeah. And if you have sharing a common goal mm -hmm. and and putting up high impediments along the way to achieve that common goal is a great way to bring exactly. people together. Um, the, the only caveat I would say on the sports bringing together people note is unless you're a Patriots fan. If you're a New England Patriots fan, yeah. you're the most isolated people. Well, I'm a Jets fan, so <laughs> I'm a proud masochist, as well as a Mets and Knicks fan. So it's wow. pretty much the uh, trifecta of Is there a tissue misery. box in the room right now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Mets look pretty good this year. That, that well, would be yeah. more of a tangent. Sorry. Um, anyway, so I, um, by virtue of you know seeing these, I was curious as to why... Um, despite many government programs, high schools in poor areas were often producing poor results. Mm -hmm. And that to me suggested something off in their grand strategy. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to go have a look. And the more I read, the more I realized people weren't talking to teachers or students or mm. parents or, um, or community members about, hey, what's going on? I'm going to put you at the center of my narrative. And I was an American studies major, and there's a great tradition in American literature of hitting the road and seeing what the people, the people, the folk are saying. A hundred percent. Yeah. And then I was, you know, I had, I had a little bit of money. I had no obligations and my mom, you know, lent me the keys to the family Mazda. And so <laughs> there you off go. in my mom's little blue car, I went and, uh, that, that summer, that experience, um, was so shocking to me to be someone who was afforded, you know, a great education. Uh, and to see how much I, I just didn't know, I was clueless of right. by virtue of my upbringing and to see how accessible it was if you just walk in with open ears and a smile. And um, and next thing I knew, you know, I, I didn't really, I had like Arlie in Lake Charles, I had really loose connections in the places I went to. And next thing I knew I was at church on Sunday in, in small town Texas. Or next thing I knew I was, you know, dancing the Sundance up in the plains with a Lakota or singing with a Baptist in the blighted neighborhoods of Cleveland. And I, you know, those experiences stuck with me in, in my head and my heart much more than any lecture I'd had in college. Not to knock my hardworking professors, but it, for, some, for some reason, what I did um, uh, meant more to me than the things I'd, I'd read for a while. Although, you know, reading helped inform me on everything I was doing. And so I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great if every kid could do this? Mm. But I thought I was a weirdo and no one, no one in their right mind would want to, you know, go from a nice life in the suburbs of Boston and go see all that. And then that all changed when I, I had that moment um, when I was substitute teaching. And also when I talked with Paul and Arlie and seeing that, hey, other adults are really interested in this too. And they're, they, they realize the you know, that, that what we're seeing in Washington right now is a symptom, not the problem. And people are thinking about how do we dig deeper at the root causes. And so that, that, that is really the complete picture of what made me and what made a few others realize that, hey, this is, this is possible. This, this is something that could really take hold. And so you're starting the project with a pilot, yeah. uh, which I think you mentioned is currently working with uh, schools in Lake Charles, Louisiana, yeah. and the suburbs of Boston. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, and, and a few towns in Texas too. So uh, Kilgore and Longview, Texas, and, and Catula, where I went that summer. So let's get into the nitty gritty yeah. a little bit, because I think a lot of um, followers of Better Angels have been particularly excited by the method that we've introduced to bring people together. Yeah, yeah. Because... Um, I think a lot of times intention and structure mm. are really important, especially at the outset. Yeah. Um, in kind of setting the tone, setting the expectation, um, almost setting the mood, uh, yeah. making sure people are comfortable and um, hopefully precluding some pitfalls that can occur if you just bring a bunch of people together with divergent views, you know, and just say, all right, Debate yeah. gun control. Yeah, lock them in a room and say good luck, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so what's been sort of your, I guess, strategic approach to fostering this conversation? Mm. And then talk a little bit about 
tactically how you do it because i know you mentioned yeah. you have the actual physical yeah. uh study abroad program right which i imagine is in the summer it's the summer yeah but i know you also do some things with technology uh which is something i think we'll want to talk a little bit about too um, yeah later on and that and the what we do on technology I mean, in short we we get kids in, in group online hangouts hmm. um you Google you Hangouts, Google? Zoom, Skype, mm -hmm. they're all, they're very similar, but we use Google Hangouts because, you know, most kids have Gmails and it's free. Right. Um, uh, in a way they've, they've, they've created the cafeteria table at which hmm. any kid in America can come and sit down hmm. and at any time. And all you need is a Gmail and there you are. And do you have an agenda for the meetings? How we, does it get kicked they're, off? They're varied. Mm -hmm. um, and keep in mind this year, we're in a trial year. So we're, I'm working right now with kids who couldn't be more different. I mean, I've got mm -hmm. one kid who hunts alligators in the fall and is fixing his F-350 every time he's on the hangout. And I've got another girl who's um, high up in uh, 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 Rep Kennedy's campaign for the Senate against Ed Markey right now. I mean, those two kids are the kind right. of kids we're bringing together. But they're also the sorts of kids who are willing to be the first through a door in a program mm -hmm. like this. So they're they're chatty kids, they're good kids. They don't need much coaching from someone like me. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do a variety of hangouts every week. Sometimes we have topic related discussions, similar to what I see a Better Angels debate being. Right. Um, instead of us uh, sort of uh, pushing each other's views against each other to find where you can see common ground, I'm working with high school kids most of their views are what mom and dad say around the dinner table. They don't mm -hmm. really have um, solidified views of their own yet, as much as the ones who listen to this might hate to hear me say that. Um, their eyes are open, their ears are open. So the, the biggest strategic move we've made in fostering healthy conversations is by working with, with high school students. Mm -hmm. um, so we have topic related discussions and that can be anything from you know Oscar winning films to uh, love and relationships, why are girls so needy? Why are boys so asleep at the wheel? Um, and then we can either talk about economic inequality or where are you guys going to college? Why is it that in Lake Charles, 40% of the kids are getting a job after high school where 2% of the kids are doing that out of, out of Concord Carlisle Regional in Massachusetts. And are you acting as a moderator or facilitator yes. of sorts? I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a moderator with a light touch. I'm there mm -hmm. to... Um, I think of it like a dinner party with new friends. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And the hope at the end is that they all get along. Right. Um, you don't need them dating or anything like that. In fact, <laughs> right. there's a liability. You don't really want that. <laughs> um, uh, but you hope they all get along. And so I'm, if the conversation slows down, I throw in a question. Mm -hmm. If the conversation's been um, what I feel there hasn't been uh, you know, many nutrients that, that they've learned from each other, I'll throw in a question that I know will, will, elicit an answer that'll be of interest to folks from either side of the divide. Um, and I honestly, the biggest thing I use is a lot of humor. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Self-deprecation is goes a heck of a long way. And um, being kind of light and goofy goes a long way. And, you know, gosh, Mr. McCullough, you're so embarrassing all the time. It's not <laughs> funny. Like, um, there's a lot of that. And that creates kind of a light atmosphere. Um, and ironically, when you you know when something is as serious as politics, the greatest effort is to to somehow make it seem not that serious, and to say that you know who we are as people is much more important. Totally. Um, so the, we do that. We have the topic related discussions. We have um, what I call Sunday sessions, which is we all sign on. You can hop on in the middle of it. I say, hey, what's on your mind? And we just we go. Um, and those are great because the I, I give the ball to the kids right away, and. They're 17, they, they get along with one another. They, they wanna make friends, that's why they're there. Um, and then once in a while, every couple of weeks, we'll have, a, we'll have a special guest come in. Um, we've got a lot of great adults who, who are supporting our program and so we'll do a Q and A with them. And that's, that's terrific for um, all sorts of kids, but especially those kids who uh, you know, might live in a small town and they want to be a lawyer in a big city one day and they can, they can have a FaceTime with someone like that. And that, that, that can make a great difference in a kid's life. And so then when it comes to the in-person exchange, mm -hmm. does Bob from Louisiana go and live with Mary's family in Newton? Yeah. And then while Mary's living with 
Bob's family? Is uh, it kind of a direct? No, exchange? it's not. It's not kid swap. Um, uh -huh. It's okay. it's uh, it's come and visit your pal. Mm -hmm. So I see. let's say I'm from Louisiana. You're from you know New York City. Uh, you would come and stay with me for two weeks. AEP would facilitate a, a host of uh, events and activities every day. Uh, you'd take part. I, as your host, could hop in. But if I'm you know, working at the grocery store, I go to my job every day, we come back at night. Now we would know each other through the hangouts. So um, they'd be like, hey, Kieran, that's what, you, you know, you're that tall, oh my God. <laughs> right. Um, uh, and then and then I would come back and do exactly the same thing, staying in your- But with me, you maintain the you, pairs. Maintain the pairs. And at night I'm saying, hey, my pals and I are going over to our friend Joey's house, come along, I hope you're good at Xbox. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, or shooting, you know, F three fifties. Or shooting, F3, yeah, exactly, right. yeah, blowing stuff up. <laughs> um, and and what you, what's what's fun is you can see um, on these hangouts, our kids get excited about the stuff that the other kids do. They just think it's cool. Totally. Um, when I talk to adults, this is you know an interesting idea to help our political system right now. When I talk to kids, this is an adventure. I mean, you're, you know, you're Huck Finn, you're getting on your raft and heading down the Mississippi, you're, you're coming, you're the new kid in the big city. I mean, this is, it's an adventure. And uh, that, that strikes a much more fundamental chord in people um, than, uh, you know, merely appealing to, to politics. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the, and, and then the, yeah, so the in-person exchange and what I'm really curious to see this year, and, and I've got all sorts of ideas because this is a trial year. So is, is this summer going to be the first yeah. when it's been regularized? Have you done any in-person exchanges? Thus not, far? not with our kids. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've brought down a few um, uh, landed New England folks uh, to the South and have right. seen uh, the transformation that happens with people um, when you meet someone and greet them with a hug instead of a handshake. Mm -hmm. Um uh, one of our board members, Bob Glauber, who's been uh, in the government and taught at Harvard for 50 years, he, I've, he, I've just watched him become this new person since he went down to the South and just learned more and found he could talk to people who voted for Donald Trump. And um, it, it, it did something to his heart, healthy things um, right. to his heart. And uh, we have yet to do, do one with students. Um, we have about 24, 26 kids who are going to do it this summer for a month. So, so kind of like 12 and 12 or roughly 12, 12 and 12. Part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, I've yet to pin down the exact head count, but it, it'll be between 20 and 30. Interesting. One question that comes to mind is how does sort of the class and power dynamics play out? Is there ever a tension when, you know, you're bringing two, two communities together, one of which has significantly more resources and yeah. social capital? How does that play out in the conversations and how are you thinking about that? Uh, as you're planning for this summer and then, um, you know, on the longer time horizon, how you might scale this in all kinds of different communities that obviously have pretty significant power differentials. Yeah. So the, it's, it's a huge issue. And I, I, on the to truth be told on the hangouts, you, you don't see it as much. Now right. you do see which kids, um, you can notice which kids have parents who've been to college. Mm -hmm. Um, you do notice which kids, uh, have been applied to 24 colleges and, 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 <laughs> right. and, are, and are you know up till one o'clock in the morning doing their homework. What's important, and you go, and it, this goes back to how do I moderate these discussions, is to not not see not not convey power dynamics, mm -hmm. but to convey that that really what you are is just making life choices, and every mm -hmm. life choice has its benefit, but it also has its pitfalls. So. It's great to live in our town, Sudbury, Massachusetts. And you know your odds of going to college are secure. Your odds of having a nice life, nice life are secure. Mm -hmm. We don't have a main street. Mm -hmm. right. um, we don't drag main on Friday night. Uh, 35 people show up to the Friday night lights football game and they're all the dads of the players. Right. Um, so at one sense, you know, you can, you can actually shift a power dynamic mm. for the minds of a high school student by just pointing out mm -hmm. some what of you the might things that are great about living in Kilgore, Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and to subscribe to say that, you know, that, that you have all the social capital being from Boston um, really subscribes to one life view. One thing I've realized going down South, and, and this isn't kind of a, um, a condescension, is that 
it's it's great to live in a little town and you can live a prosperous life in a little town so long as the the larger economy sees value in that. Um, so a lot of what I'm trying to do is point out both the good and the bad, no matter where we're from. Um, the other thing is though, is yes, there is, there is a dynamic, there is a dichotomy. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, the larger way that kids are viewing how to go about life today will place certain groups of kids above others in that dichotomy. I think that's going to be more accentuated this summer. And part right. of the reason why we once have it. Once they're actually there. Once they're there. All of a sudden you're in a $2 million house, you know, you open the fridge and there's, you know, yeah. Zaybars everywhere. I don't know if they have Zaybars in Boston. I'm <laughs> never thinking heard of, of those some yet. kind of, you know, bougie, delicious vibe. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think um, uh, my little theory is, is that your friendship matters more than that. Totally. And, um, and, Oh, what's the, there's a great line from the movie Philadelphia Story. Um, like, you know, class is only what people make of it in yeah. social situations, I think. It also makes me think of um, almost like community capital. Yeah. I don't know if I'm coining a phrase here, but. Someone write that down. <laughs> yeah, like, like you said, you know, if I grow up in one of these particularly suburban affluent suburbs, um, I mean, I grew up in. A city, so I don't know if I'm really speaking from personal experience, but it strikes me that it, it can be quite isolating in some ways. Sure. Um, and then maybe you go down to a place like Louisiana, and there's a certain richness of community that I think could be, uh, you know, quite nourishing and, and frankly exhilarating. So I think that's yeah. exciting to think about too. That idea, yeah. So. And, and I'm hoping that'll supersede the kind of, well, as you said, the dichotomies we were talking about. The, um, you know, as I said, my dad teaches at a, a sort of a high school in a, in a more affluent town. Again, there's diversity in all these high schools, but a more affluent town outside Boston. I went to one and I've spent a lot of time in these schools. Seeing what our kids right now in the country need each other as much as they need anything. Um, mm -hmm. I think kids in wealthier suburbs of major cities feel a little low on community, feel a little low on um, growing up with values that matter more than ambition and getting mm -hmm. off to a great college. Mm -hmm. Kids need a sense of a life where this immense pressure to go to a great school, to have, as you know, my friends in the South say, sort of a cookie cutter existence. And to fill your parents' shoes in some ways. In some ways, I, to just lift it, have it lifted off of their shoulders. And right now, for instance, in, in the schools that we work in in Massachusetts, um, you know, a deeply personal question for a kid is what's your GPA? Hmm. Um, one of my students told me that the other day, that's too personal, don't ask me that. Um, what does that tell you about what's on these kids' minds all the time? Right. And then I think, you know, small town kids need to see life outside the small town. and. I mean, that's that's as much as what I've heard from people there is my own assessment of things. So really what these kids need, I think, is, is each other. And I'm hoping that that will supersede this kind of potential caustic power play that mm -hmm. that we're worried about. But again, it's so much of what we're doing right now is, is we'll see. Yeah, totally. And I mean, there's just so many different kinds of communities in the United States. So it's hard yeah. to say how things will play out um, I mean, I'm thinking about some of the overall dynamics. All of this is taking place within the context of increasing urbanization. Yeah. And I think a lot of these smaller towns that have traditionally uh, been strong in community are also beginning to see sort of a hollowing out yeah. uh, as people uh, move to the city to pursue jobs. And uh, a lot of times people who stick around uh, can become... Uh, hamstrung or even trapped in a cycle of poverty or, you know, obviously yeah. the opioid yeah. epidemic is, is, is ravaging so many communities. So I wonder too, if, um, you know, some of the students who go visit some of these more affluent, more deeply resourced communities can then come back to their own communities with yeah. sort of a, a newfound, vision and network that could be used to support their own family yeah. and friends and, and schools. That would be a dream come true. And, you know, that's, that's where this program has the potential to check off m more than just um, the creating empathy for one another right. box. And the other thing, though, that could happen is, is what we call cherry picking. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a pastor in the South told me, well, if you go cherry picking, what you end up with in the end is a box full of cherries and that's a pretty great thing. But even then we, I don't want to pluck the good kids out of these towns. Right, and like then, a brain drain almost. Like a brain drain. And next thing you know, if you're a little town in America through the American Exchange Project, you're just exporting your human capital. And, right. Um, uh, you know, thanks a lot, guys. I mean, I, that's not what we're after either. Now, right. um, uh, I don't think that'll happen. I think the pull home is a, is a real thing. Um, we're for, certainly, I don't admit kids based on their merit or their potential to succeed in, in you know, New York City. Um, in fact, I take the kids who, who might not have the, ever the opportunity to do that. Um, but it is, again, this is one area of concern that we have to have our eyes on right now. We don't want to be cherry picking. So it's your full-time job, and I imagine that you are hoping to scale this. Do you envision ultimately some kind of movement, some kind of working alliance of students who are then growing older and becoming leaders in their schools? Those who go off to college are still involved. Those who stay in their community are still involved. How do you imagine this work scaling just beyond the pilot? Yeah, I, I think um, well, the, the biggest thing, the biggest moment, um, I'm the mo moment I'm most excited for this year is after our students, however many it ends up being, come back from their exchange and we all get together at a room in a restaurant and I stand up on a chair and I say, okay, what's next? Mm -hmm. um, every little bit of wisdom that's created this interesting idea that we're, that I'm working on now uh, came from our kids. Um, mm -hmm. It was augmented by the academics and advisors we talk to all the time and my own experiences, but you know, kids are really driving this. And so I want to hear what they want to do next. I want to hear how they want to stay involved. I want to hear how they want to be plugged in to this, you know, this new field of democracy building that seems to show a lot of promise to what I think is the greatest issue in the world right now, which is the kind of the downfall of, of the American democracy. Totally. I mean, I see a lot of similarities with what you just said to Better Angels. Yeah. Um, because initially, you know, we started with this one workshop model that was really focused on building empathy and growing trust, building understanding beyond stereotypes. But that really turned out not to be an end in itself, yeah. but an entree into this larger movement, which is made up of, at this point, over 50 local alliances, yeah, Better Angels alliances, which sort of continue the work of building that community. And as you said, are constantly coming up with ideas for new programs. What so, are some of their ideas, if I can just pick your brain? Yes, yeah, so two of our most recent ideas, and this all takes place within the context of our 2020 focus, which is emerging uh, and will be discussed at our upcoming convention in May, which I hope you can attend, uh, are how can we bubble up to affect politics. Yeah. So right. not better angels, headquarters, engaging politicians or focus at the elite level, right. but how can we empower our grassroots movement to affect the political landscape? And so two areas that we're exploring, one is reinventing the town hall. Yeah. And reinventing candidate debates. Yeah. Because we hear over and over again from both sides that those two institutions are broken. Oh my gosh, they just feel watch like, any debate. I... Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a Democrat, so I've been following the Democratic debates and- <laughs> Note the optimism. <laughs> yeah, it's just frustrating. I mean, yeah. they're sort of run by the media networks, first of all, so they're optimizing for conflict and sound yeah. bites. And they're not really addressing constituents' concerns. And they're held weekly. It's like NFL. I mean, it, you know. Yes. Sorry, I missed this one. Don't worry. There'll be one in four days. <laughs> I think the entertainment factor uh, sort of wraps around a lot of the degradation of our politics. Hugely. Uh, in many ways. So we are developing models for reinventing town halls in a way that elevates the people mm. and makes the politicians responsive to them. Mm -hmm but not in a way where the politicians are just there to receive abuse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, 
And then the candidate debates were sort of taking our approach to citizens debates and then bringing it to political candidates. So yeah. we're hoping to sort of unveil that at the convention. Um, and the other big focus for us too has been the media. Yeah. So that's another thing that there's been almost universal agreement on between the two sides is that the media is dividing us. Yeah. You know, regardless of whether you, I mean, you're always going to have your hyper partisans um, on both sides. Regardless of whether you're watching Fox News or MSNBC, I think people recognize that the media has played a, a role in driving rancor and animosity and polarization. So one thing that I'm focused on, and I'm going to be holding our first meeting soon, is a Better Angels Media Caucus. Interesting. So this is actually bringing together members of the media, mm -hmm. a diverse group of members of the media, both ideologically, but also geographically, and also in terms of format. So, you know, we might have a national reporter for the Washington Post, mm -hmm. and then a local talk show radio host in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and an opinion editor from Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, bringing them together under the aegis of Better Angels, but empowering them to discuss what are the ways in which the media divides us and what are some ways the media might be able to bring us together. Sure. And can they come to consensus on a potential Better Angels way for media? Yeah. And maybe they can't, right? I mean, this a lot of what we do is is just sort of purely democracy in its purest essence. Yeah. But the polarization that we see has basically dysfunctionalized that to a massive extent because if you do not trust that the person you're talking to is coming in good faith and you think they're only there to score points or humiliate you, yeah. you're not going to want to venture out into that minefield. You're going to want to stay in your own trench and just lob, lob grenades, grenades yeah. over at them, uh, you know, to use, I guess, a trite <laughs> war metaphor. Um, but so all of that is to say we've been starting at the grassroots, but we're also thinking about how can we influence institutions? Sure. So the media, the academy, we're scaling our Better Angels debates on college campus. Yeah. And then ultimately, politicians. I think, you know, <laughs> I've got eight high schools and 100 kids and, you know, 50% of them don't show up every week. So right. I don't know if we're quite thinking of affecting the great institutions yet. Um, hopefully one day. And I certainly want our kids to feel plugged into that kind of a movement. And we, we dream of national scale. And indeed, we're heading in that direction. Um, there are lots of folks across the country who are interested in this. I'd love for AEP one day to be a club in every American high school. Um, just as a component of their education, you should learn about the country you're growing up in. You should see it firsthand for yourself. Um, and you guys have the fun factor. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if I'm in high school and there's a club where I can get to go to a new exciting place for free and I've already checked out some video sessions and the, the kids seem cool. Yeah. In some ways, that's a lot more appealing than something that seems more intellectual or academic, potentially. You don't need to like politics to do AEP. Right. Um, you don't need to know anything about the state of America to do AEP. This is really born from just a curiosity of what's around the corner, what's down the road, let's go see it together. Mm -hmm. And we place at the head of it, you know, people like us who can make sense of what these kids are seeing. And um, the other, for us though, and this is, I think, much closer to Better Angels. Um, I really hope to get the parents of these kids involved in some capacity in the exchange. And the way I think it's going to happen is the parents are going to come pick up their children at the end of their stays in these communities and we'll host a barbecue. And the hope right. is that, because um, parents, you know, as you see every day in, in all your programs of Better Angels, adults are far apart and, and, um, firm in their firm in their beliefs. It's it's part of being an adult. Mm -hmm. um, here's what I think. Here's what I stand for, and I'm going to go by that. I've built my life on that. Um, but as we've seen, you know, half the battle is providing the forum mm -hmm. where they can come together, and then another thirty percent is just including in that forum an environment that's conducive to friendly conversation. And the way we're trying to foster that 
friendly conversation within the environment of bringing these kids together in their communities is by starting off a conversation that begins with, um, uh, thank you for taking care of my child. Hmm. My daughter had the most wonderful time these two weeks. She's called me every day um, and I, I'm so glad to be here. And thank you, you know, Jessica was a joy to have in our house. Um, I don't know how that spins into uh, incivility, that conversation. Again, we'll see. But what I'm trying to do is, is take elements that are more important to us than politics, um, our, our love for our children uh, being the main one, and creating a scenario that places that fundamental desire uh, at the core of a conversation to show that we have a lot more in common than we think. And part of in the media and, um, and debates, they all play into this, have defined me as a Democrat more than me as a person, you know, me as a brother, a son, a, uh, you know, a boyfriend, a coach. Um, uh, and so people see in me my politics before me as a person. And when you take the idea, when you, when you focus on the human, I think you end up with a much more holistic and healthy view of your country, your community, and the world. And we're in our small way trying to foster that. So how that manifests itself in institutional change, I'm not so sure yet. But like you, we're starting at the ground and working up, and we're starting with kids and working up. And it's so important for me um, f to create this feeling that our kids are a part of something. You know, this is a team. You're you're on the in. And you know, we're gonna have logos and hats, and this is what we believe, and this is a this is a new way of living. It's a new way of talking to one another. Um, you can call it a movement if you want. I mean, I, I get advertisements about the new movement that started every day, but you can right. call it a movement if you want. Um, and you don't have to discard or water down your other identities, right? I mean, you can still have your Trump hat or your right. AOC and, hat or right. and there's, whatever else. There's right? room on the bus for everyone because there have there has to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, e pluribus unum. That that, that is that is the great challenge that we are uh, given in 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 our own answer to this question of how do we all live together? You, you, we have to do it together. We have to come out of union. We have to be able to make decisions with one another. Um, and so, again, that's the kind of culture we're trying to create. And part of the trial year is to figure out how that can 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 grow into what looks like change. Right. And so obviously this summer is going to be the heat of the 2020 oh, yeah. election. Oh yeah. Has the election come up and in particular has President Trump come up? Sure. How, and and how has that played out in the so conversations? So the um uh it kids are cautious about it cuz they know it is a, it's a caustic element. Mm -hmm. Um but uh, a great moment happened the other night. Um the uh, <laughs> one of the strongest friendships that have formed in these hangouts. And keep in mind, these are kids who have never met one another. Um, and already they're adding each other on social media, which I'm told constitutes best friends today. Right. Um, I'm concerned about the youth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, anyway, so two of the best friends, um, two of our students are very involved with democratic politics in Massachusetts, and they are both in uh, administrative roles in the high school Democrats of America. So they're politically active kids. Um, on their way to terrific colleges. Another one of our students is a uh, aspiring politician uh, from Lake Charles, Louisiana. And he is the vice president of the high school Republicans Club at Sam Houston High School in Moss Bluff, which is a little sort of unincorporated town outside Lake Charles. And he's, he's on his way to LSU in the fall. Hmm. And they're great friends. Couldn't be further apart politically. These right. um, it's two girls in Massachusetts, and then and then Tyler in Louisiana. Um, the other day, we were doing a hangout on I believe the topic was um, race relations. It was around MLK Day, and we were has it gotten better? Has it gotten worse? Um, let's talk. Simple topic. Simple topic. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not device at all. But was that, and it became that because these kids are so honest and open. And what they realize is that <clears throat> it ain't all that different, Boston, to Louisiana. Um, and, and anyway, I had to, the conversation went on, was set to go for, for an hour. It went on for about two. Um, and then I had to go. And uh, I said, but I saw that, that the kids were, were great. And I knew the kids who were on the hangout. I knew they'd be work well with each other. So I said, hey, I'm going to leave the call up. 
because I, I can hang up or the whole call at once. So I'm going to leave the call up and I'm going to go away. And you guys sign off whenever you feel you, you the conversation is wrapped up. Um, and then they said, great. And so bye-bye, Mr. McCullough. Off I went. Um, uh, and then an hour and a half later, I go back upstairs to close up my laptop and, and you know, call it a night. And I hear voices hmm. from the room in which I was talking. And I come around the corner and there are Caroline, Aliana, and Tyler going at it. And they are on the, how the heck do you believe what you believe right. tangent. And he's on the, well, how the heck do you believe what you believe? And she says, well, don't you realize you're contradicting yourself? But yeah, but don't you realize this is so different? Well, yeah, but, and they were doing it with smiles and they were laughing and there was never a rift in the friendship. And I, you know, in my own silent way as teachers sometimes do observe, wouldn't it be great if we were back to this? Mm -hmm. I mean, they weren't, they were ribbing each other. It was great. Mm -hmm. It was lovely to see. And it was because we'd spent a few weeks, um, uh, uh, establishing friendships. There, our first hangout begins with, uh, um, actually, this is a quick anecdote and I, and I hope you can see some wisdom for what you're doing in this too. So I, uh, we had our first hangout and like everyone on the first day, I didn't, I knew what I wanted to work for, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And so I threw out the old icebreaker question to the first group of kids. Um, and I said, okay, each of you is on a road trip between any four places in the world. Where are you going to go? And you're bringing three people, um, a celebrity from now, a celebrity who's dead, and someone that no one else in the group knows. So that way you can tell me about your, you know, your beloved grandmother. That's a good one. Yeah. Hmm. And I expected each of them to answer on their own. Within 10 minutes, the kids started planning the same road trip. No, no, no. I want to go to Buenos Aires. No, no, no. I don't want to go to South America. That's too <laughs> crazy down there. I'm going to get kidnapped. I want to go to Europe. <laughs> right. Um, and so now every session begins with, the kids who have don't know each other, don't even remember each other's names, planning this collective road trip. They're all in the car together. They're all going on the trip together. Um, and then they've got to figure out what they have in common, which we all like uh, Kevin Hart. We all like The Rock. Um, we all think it'd be cool to, to ride shotgun next to Abraham Lincoln. And then they do the hardest part of all, which is why should my grandma Betty uh, come instead of your Uncle Joe? Hmm. the people that no one know and they start negotiating and immediately they figure out and that that has this year that has set the tone for all the hangouts that they're all in the car together they're all going in the same direction it's a great metaphor it yeah conveniently worked out i'll throw the credit to my girlfriend for saying that'd be a good icebreaker um but uh uh what's happened is is we've we've created as you said this this environment in which kids can can talk and they can rib each other they can go at each other they can really ask why and i, and I think it's because Going back to the beginning, we've made the move to work with high school kids who 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 are just, they're starting off closer together mm -hmm. than I think a lot of our adults are. And so I think as we look to what's going to create change, where the movement will come from, um, my insight from the last four or five months working in the American Exchange Project is look to young people. Mm. Um, they, they are keenly aware of what's going on and... Uh, are not optimistic about the future and are desiring change and starting from a position where they're a lot closer together to their peers than the adults might be. Yeah, and then I imagine, you know, kids go home and hear almost like doomsday stuff from their parents. I mean, oh God, if you're mom and dad at the dinner table yeah. and saying, you know, the rule of law is gone in this country or you're maybe in Louisiana and your parents are like, you know, the deep state is oh my gosh. I destroying wonder, America. I mean, how many kids do you think in this country right now who have parents who are Democrats um, have a mom or a dad that walk through the door and say the following line? Well, you'll never believe what he did today. Right. Um, right. Here we go again. <laughs> Uh, and I think I heard a lot of parents who were Republicans from, uh, you know, uh, 2008 to 2016 say the same thing. Um, again, founded or not, we can get into all that, but it, right. that's what our kids are hearing right now. And that's what they're seeing. And so, well, two just quick logistical questions that come to mind. Mm -hmm. One is for the video chats. Do you guys have sort of like a core group of the same kids each time? Or will sometimes someone invite a friend? Yeah. And then the second question is, do you record these conversations? So because they're under the age of 18, um, 
I haven't recorded yet. We will start recording them. I take notes on all of it. And partially that's also because um, the organizational structure is going to be very different moving forward. So we're going to start next year to basically, um, you know, govern this, what could be a pretty big organization. Um, we're going to create clubs in high schools. And so as a junior, you'll sign up for the AEP club and juniors will have different requirements on hangouts than seniors. And we can get into all of that. For now, I just have my 100 students. Um, and to show you the kind of interest, I gave a talk about this at a high school in Massachusetts. I had 50 kids sign up within five minutes of the talk. Hmm. Um, th there's a palpable desire. So I've, I mean, I've got 100 students. Um, it's never mandatory that they show up. I just throw out a, a Google form to them every week and say, here's the times, here's what we're gonna be talking about, here's who our special guest is. Sometimes 62 kids sign up, sometimes 18 kids sign up. You know, if it's Mardi Gras in Louisiana, we don't get the Louisiana kids that week. And whoever shows up, shows up. And if, you know, Tyler has his friend Josh over one night, then Josh has taken part in the hangout. It, it is very much a, I like, I think of the cafeteria table metaphor mm -hmm. again and again, just sure, come on, sit down, we got a seat for everybody. Um, Again, moving forward, that'll be a little bit different because we'll hopefully have many, many, many more kids in on the Hangouts. Totally. And Better Angels has thousands of volunteers across Great. the country, some of whom are going to be listening to this podcast, I hope, and many of whom I think might be interested in yeah. this project. And I think you've tapped into a sense of civic duty and almost like civic excitement. Um, I think people are starved for something that feels uplifting. And when it comes to people's kids, I think they're they're willing to be a little bit more understanding and maybe almost take a little bit of risk in mm. um, taking heat. Because, you, you know, and this is one thing we're talking about at Better Angels these days, is that in order to have these difficult conversations, you have to be courageous, yeah. not just to withstand the judgment or yeah. potential judgment and yeah. injury and insult that you may receive from the quote unquote other side, but also the heat you're going to take from your own side. Yeah. Um, you know, you see it on social media a lot, but it's like, why are you fraternizing with these it takes a lot crazy of effort. people? It takes a lot of effort too. I mean, the, I mean, by virtue of having this job, I'm lucky to live in, in both worlds. And I see a lot of people. I mean, it's explained to me why we're as divided as we are. It's also explained to me why you know, almost 48% of the country doesn't vote in a presidential mm -hmm. election. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are removed. A lot of people look at it and think, you know, you want to be a part of that? Like, right. It's um, toxic. I it's got toxic. things to do. Yeah. And, and so you got to put forth the effort. And that's the one thing I ask of our kids when they sign up. You know, I'm not going to ask anything from you other than other than your effort. Um, cool. It, it's hard. Well, I think it's an amazing effort. I think it's sort of perfectly timed. I'm really excited to see what happens this summer. One other thing I'm thinking about is this: this seems like ripe for a documentary. It <laughs> seems ripe for documenting in in some way. So, I'm hopeful that you know. You you can just get the word out because I think yeah. it's, it 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 has that sort of like almost made for TV narrative yeah. where there's like uh, some dynamic tension yeah uh, because you're you're bringing people together uh, who have conflicting views and come from different backgrounds uh, and you don't really know what's going to happen yeah the so. and um we it's a great hope to get the word out and a great way to create change on the mass level with only you know, your, your 24 students is to get the story out. And video is the new vernacular, as I read the other day. I'll and I bet it. the students probably have better ideas than we would for how to do that. Yeah, we're, we're working on, we have various video projects. Um, you know, one thing that's really what our organization is, is it's kind of the, the two-way bridge between both sides. And so all, you know, one day we could do teacher exchanges. That'd be great. Um, our, our high school students make videos of their towns on sort of the, hey, come to my town uh, narrative, which is a great expose to see life from the viewpoint of a 16 year old of all these American communities. So um, yeah, we'll see. We've got people interested in, in producing that kind of material about what we're doing. Um, nothing's definite yet. And um, maybe even the kids themselves. I mean, I'm yeah. just I'm a, a, vlog, a, robust... a vlog would be cool. Yeah. A robust TikTok strategy. 
uh, I went I was down. Told by enough people to stay away. I yeah, I was TikTok. I was resisting. Did you go down for, the hole? Uh, yeah, I finally <laughs> went down the TikTok rabbit hole the other night. Um, it's pretty wild how yeah big the audience is. Oh my gosh! It's also owned by the Chinese, which <laughs> is a little bit troubling, just <laughs> given that you know we have. That's Tens of millions of high school students just kind of feeding their data. Oh, yeah. If you, um, yeah, if you want to reach kids, hit the airwaves. Well, David, I think it's really inspirational what you're doing and sort of embodies the spirit of American, you know, can-do-ism and is just a, another example of Americans who are trying to help us perfect our union uh, through their work and and through their approach to their fellow citizens. So I commend you. Thank you for coming on the podcast. And yeah, I would encourage any of our listeners, what's the best way for them to get involved? How can they most be helpful to you? Well, the, the if you want to learn more, if you want to get in touch, um, www.americanexchangeproject.org. Um, there's a sign up tab and part of the sign up tab you can you know, elect to learn more, be on the mailing list, or even contact me directly. So go to the website. Um, that's the best way to get involved. And also, thank you. And I, I could say all the same things about you and Better Angels. And it's inspiring to see, um, with a little garage band startup like my own, uh, what one can come to accomplish, uh, and then really finally create what hopefully is lasting change for our country. Cool, man. Well, thanks again for coming on the pod. And, uh, <laughs> Best of luck to you this summer. Hopefully see you at the convention. That'd be fun. Thanks very much. Peace.